Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the second in our series of conversations with artists, um, which uh, Jane Burrell and our education program has uh, put together, uh, co-opting co me into uh, having conversations with artists. I actually have conversations with artists all the time, but I usually don't have them on stage. Um, first of all, I'd just also like to thank the Kenneth T. and Eileen L. Norris Foundation and Maxine and Jean Rosenfeld for supporting the series. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Michael Govan. Uh, Wallace Annenberg, director of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art for almost a year. Um, I'd also like to remind you and invite you to the next program, which will be April 12th with the uh, fabulous Diana Thader. So hopefully we'll see you there. And uh, yeah. And uh, so what we're going to do tonight is uh, Robert Irwin is here, somebody who in Los Angeles and at, in the world at large again needs no introduction uh, somebody well known to those of you who live in los angeles but he is an amazing artist an amazing person and i feel privileged to have uh, known him for many years i consider him and his work to be my uh, teacher uh, and him to be my mentor for many years uh, for things he taught me about art and about life um, i think i was first attracted to the work and its absolute uh, abstraction. Uh, the fact that this artist could make a room with nothing was so extraordinary, and that he had brought art history to the point where you could make a room with nothing, and of course what you found out is that there was a lot going on, and there was no such thing as nothing, and it opened uh, the door to a whole other way of thinking about seeing and perceiving. You know, in, in art history texts, there's always a short section on light and space artists in Los Angeles who in the late 60s rethought the nature of what art could be, um, dispensed with things like painting and sculpture in a traditional sense, and worked particularly with uh, light and space. Um, light being one of the operative features and always tied to the light in Los Angeles. Now, while those are uh, cliches and perhaps oversimplifications, there's certainly something to that, and the light in Los Angeles is certainly uh, very inspiring. I got to, uh, I saw um, Robert Irwin's work in many places, and, but I first came into really close encounter with it and an understanding, a relationship to it at um, the villa of Count Panza in Varese, who people here know because his collection, part of his collection is in the Museum of Contemporary Art in downtown. And uh, the second half of that collection, which includes work by Robert Irwin, uh, I was involved in acquiring for the Guggenheim Museum many years ago in the late 80s. And it was there that I encountered works in situ in the villa in Varese. Uh, it was also soon after that that I went to uh, study art and uh, for a moment to be an artist at the University of California, San Diego, where I saw his work on the campus and made a huge impression on me. Um, many of you may have seen the Museum of Contemporary Art exhibition, the retrospective that traveled and was here. And then I had an opportunity to work with Bob at DIA, uh, first on an exhibition and then in the creation of a whole museum, Dia Beacon, which we're going to talk a little bit about tonight. And it's especially uh, a privilege to be here in Los Angeles uh, working with him. Uh, I guess, in a way, I followed him to Los Angeles. Uh, he is the quintessential LA artist. Uh, many of you have probably read a text uh, about his, well, I guess it's 25 years old, so you could say it's about the early part of his life. It was written by Lawrence Weschler called Seeing is Forgetting the Name of the Thing One Sees. Uh, many people have said about this small book that it inspired more people to be artists than the Velvet Underground inspired rock and rollers. <laughs> Robert Irwin has been a teacher and taught many other artists as well as museum directors. Um, and when I say about teaching, things he taught me include things like um, about the nature of the environment around us and seeing in three-dimensional space and understanding perception and psychology in three-dimensional space. Um, particularly, this came, became a, a, a dialogue when we worked on the museum in Beacon. And everything became a discussion. Which way the light entered the building? This was an existing factory that we were converting into a museum, which we'll show pictures of. 
how you would approach it. Um, Robert Irwin, he worked as a landscape designer, an architect, an aesthetic philosopher, um, and certainly an artist. And I think he is also, um, he has, you, some of you may have even heard talks he has given about art, modern art, the future of art. And one of the things he often refers to is the trajectory of art through the century. I'm going to absolve him of giving that fabulous lecture tonight. We'll try to get into conversation. But by way of introduction, he uh, talks often about Mondrian's culture of determined relations and the way abstract artists like Mondrian and Malevich in the early part of the century dealt with relationships between color and form um, and rather than images. And of course, he, um, it was Mondrian very, very early in the century who predicted the end of art, quote, the end of art separated from our surrounding environment. This is Mondrian, not Bob Irwin. Um, but that would not mean the end of art, Mondrian wrote. By the unification of architecture, sculpture, and painting, a new plastic reality will be created, he predicted. Painting and sculpture will not manifest themselves as separate objects, but being purely constructive will aid the creation of a surrounding, not merely utilitarian or rational, but also pure and complete in its beauty. And it's taken a century, I think, for Mondrian's prediction to be realized uh, in the work of uh, Robert Irwin, and I certainly feel that. Many other things that I learned, and I'll just, just to say a few things by way of introduction, is the difference between uh, quantity and quality, and what it means to use the word quality, which maybe we can talk about later in the talk. Um, Robert Irwin, writing in this case, not Mondrian, perhaps the future role of the artist will be to act directly as the arbiter of qualities in our lives. Quality not as an add-on, as it is now, but as criteria in all matters of planning. And this is a theme that the idea of bring, bringing the, the artist, bringing aesthetics into everything we do and into how we think and plan. Um, he also notes, as a corollary to that, qualities exist only as long as a perceiving individual keeps them in play. And so we have a big role as the viewer, as a participant in this uh, environment. Another thing, perhaps, to say that I, I learned from Robert Irwin was about the phenomenology of perception, uh, the, the name of a book by a famous philosopher who we've discussed often. But he says, Robert Irwin says, there's an essential kind of knowing which comes from a purely phenomenological basis. Um, he also says, the relationship between art and viewer is firsthand now experience, and there is no way it can be carried to you through any kind of secondary system, such as art criticism. Uh, for example, I would guess. <laughs> and also, I try to take into account everything bearing on the problem or the situation. For example, a sense of scale is not only in and of itself, but is equally conditioned by where you arrive from, the scale of the New York subway, or the big sky country of Montana. I try to take all of this into account, and I guess following his lead, I have tried to do that in everything that I have approached. He is an artist who's also very vital, working um, in Los Angeles here, working on projects around the country and the world. Um, this is a photograph which I just show of an exhibition which just closed, I guess, last month or one month ago, um, called, it's titled, Who's Afraid of Red, Yellow, and Blue? I just read you the note from The New Yorker. Uh, Who's Afraid of Red, Yellow, and Blue? One of Irwin's finest works sandwiches space between three vast panels overhead, painted the eponymous colors and identical panels on the floor. The paint is glossy and reflective. Illumination is natural from skylights. The experience is ambient, ambulatory, and slowly engulfing. Irwin expatiates on the matter-of-fact sublime of Barnett Newman's paintings of the same name. Lawrence Weschler titled a book on Irwin, Seeing is Forgetting the Name of the Thing One Sees. In seeing this work, you may forget who sees it, losing yourself in sheer perception. Do not miss it. So. Um, He's an artist who uh, uh, is working today in making projects like this. So I would like you to welcome Robert Irwin, and we'll continue a conversation. We do this all the time, but definitely not in front of this many people. Am I, am I working? Yeah. You're working. Can you hear us? Is, is it all right if I put my hat on? Uh, I can't. It makes, this thing blinds me. 
and I'd like to be able to see. <laughs> there you go. Um, so what, what I'd like to do is just, uh, again, start with a few images, as I did in the last talk, that are here in Los Angeles, and uh, just show a few works to remind those of you who know the work, who have seen the work, and perhaps those of you who don't know the work, I will try to show a few images. They don't show up well in uh, photographs, as you'll see. But if we can have, OK, next slide. This is a painting in our collection that I think is hanging right now. It's called Band in Boston. It's 1962, and it's, uh, they're referred to as line paintings, these paintings. Uh, again, the photograph does not do it justice. You'd have to go to the gallery to see it. It's a kind of lavender color um, with, it? it's a bit of a gray lavender. That's hard to tell. <laughs> uh, you see the four lines. There are simpler versions of this, but this takes us back to when you were a painter um, and an important painter in Los Angeles. And this painting, I guess for me, this is on the road to something else, for sure. And you made another series of paintings with less lines after this. Yeah, I made uh, uh, a series of I did I did, made a series of paintings with just two lines. Um, actually, I, I was very uh, uh, very interested, and in, 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 uh, for me, it was a really breakthrough because these paintings with the four lines are still paintings in the sense that they're still somewhat compositional that one reads the lines the way that one reads the painting. They do, in a sense, have a bit of a pictorial, so they're sort of at the last leg of that, but they're pictorial in one sense. That certain lines come forward, other ones recede. Uh, the ones with the two lines, what I was fascinated by is the ones with two lines are using exactly the same means, except just the two lines, and it changes the whole structure of how you actually perceive the pain. There's no longer a relational thing where one reads the lines against each other. Not, they do not go forward or go backward. Uh, you find yourself uh, in a kind of mesmerized, uh, 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 in, uh, it's being involved, it's sort of enveloped in the thing. And it's actually an entirely different way of, of looking at things. And uh, for me, that was obviously a, uh, uh, a kind of seminal moment. Uh, which led you to another kind of thinking beyond that. We were having this discussion about uh, your uh, arguing that it is impossible to really photograph works and, and, uh, and, and really understand the work from a photograph. And then, of course, you began making paintings like this. <laughs> this is, uh, again, to talk about resources, this is in the Broad collection. It's 1964-66. And I show this, of course, uh, when we were assembling slides, um, there was a discussion of whether we should include this slide because you can't see the canvas at all. This is a <laughs> dot painting, right, Joanne? <laughs> which has a, a very specific feeling to it, which is impossible to photograph. And for me, this makes the big statement about the relationship between uh, art and photography of art and was the next step in the development of work that went somewhere else entirely. Um, this is also a work in our collection, a disc, uh, untitled, 1968, which is one of the metal discs, um, which is 60 inches in diameter. And again, you can't really, if you haven't seen one of these, it's impossible to understand what's happening here in terms of the uh, object. This is an object which floats off the wall um, and the kind of highlights or shadows around it are from the lights, which are evenly lighting it from four points. Um, and the, the work is entirely phenomenal and optical. Well, what, uh, just to fill that in a little bit, uh, from the, after the line, after, when I had done the line paintings, <coughs> I had come that far. <coughs> it was not what I thought I was going to be doing, but it, 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 I was following a thread, and at one point, uh, I wondered if I could paint a painting that didn't have a line at all. I liked the idea of the straight lines because they had no, you couldn't raw shock them or psychoanalyze them. You didn't suddenly say, oh, it's a, it's a cow jumping over a moon or it's uh, this or that. Uh, and uh, the means had become, I think, fairly uh, clear and simple, but then suddenly the idea of the possibility of why, why the line at all. And I, for the first time, uh, got a sense of this idea that uh, that, that uh, pictorial art is, is fundamentally a system of signs, signs, metaphors, that they're made up of these, and they are ultimately a meaning structure, very elaborate meaning structures. And uh, 
that this history that had preceded me, and I was now following in a way, had brought me to a point where um, I was at the last vestige of the sign, and the sign no longer really meant anything. It was not a part of a meaning structure. And so the question was, well, do I need it at all? How do I paint a painting without a mark as such? Um, and uh, the, that uh, became the dot paintings. They were very slightly curved in all directions, and so that if you took that canvas and put it alongside of a normal canvas, right. uh, or the kind that I had before, it was already charged or infused with a kind of energy. Uh, I, but being a painter, I couldn't stop at that point. I still didn't trust it, I guess, or whatever, and so I made these little dots. Uh, bright red dots that uh, slowly diffused as they went out and then a bright green dot between each one of them. And uh, they would cancel each other out or actually interact ener energy-wise and created a, a field of energy, which if you waited for a moment, gave yourself a chance, it would, it would manifest itself. Uh, it took a little bit of time and required again, like with the late lines, a kind of uh, a, a moment of of uh, adjusting to another kind of seeing. Uh, my, my best story about that is that uh, my mother, Goldie, uh, my cousins all came to uh, her house and they said, um, Bob's having a show at the LA County Museum and we're gonna go up and see it. And she said, oh, I don't know that you're gonna <laughs> wanna do that. <laughs> and they said, oh, no, no, we're very proud of him. He's, He's our cousin, and so we're going to go see that show. So they came up to see the show, and they came back to my mother, and they said, Goldie, there was nothing there. <laughs> and she said, I told you it wouldn't be easy. <laughs> my mother had a great way of having a kind of final say on those things. Uh, 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 but at that point, also, I uh, realized for the first time this idea of a frame. And uh, the whole idea that one can frame the world. When I look around at the world, uh, perceptually, there are no frames. That's not how we see it all. Uh, the world surrounds us. It's completely around, and it's multidimensional. It's not three-dimensional. It's multidimensional. It's, uh, you know, it's what one people refer to when they say four-dimensional, which is really the phenomenal world, which is in constant motion, in constant change, and in constant sets of relationships. And we perceive audibly, uh, tactily, uh, visually, et cetera, et cetera, au free. And uh, it's a complex uh, composite that we make. And that the idea of a frame is really the process of intellection, that we intellect, we elect something to select something. We do it on the basis of whatever kind of meaning or function we're pursuing. And it's a very useful uh, and uh, meaningful kind of perception. But it is h highly structured, and in fact, as painting, it's a highly structured learned logic because it's not actually how we see it all. And I would like to propose, and at that point I was proposing, that the whole history of modern art, having come this far, was at least uh, uh, an opportunity to inquire as if, in fact, there isn't another way of understanding things, another way of going. And so I tried to paint a painting that didn't begin and end at the edge. It broke the frame. I, without realizing it, I took the four corners as being kind of critical mm -hmm. and made it round because it was less and allowed the uh, thing to become lost in or married to its shadow, therefore breaking the frame of the painting um, without realizing that everywhere else was reading it as a mandala and it had become some kind of spiritual object. <laughs> and uh, I'm about as spiritual as a fullback at Ohio State, is what it might usually say. <laughs> Could and be uh, it's, it's the last thing that I wanted to do. I, I, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, it comes with the territory, as it were. And so, I've seen these show now. You've begun to show some of these in a natural light and let them just exist well, in they space actually, now, and they actually do They function. actually were better in a natural light, and they were painted in a Problem natural light. Problem is museums light. don't usually have natural light. Exactly. So I had to come up with the, the shadow thing, which is a way of doing it. It works, but it's a little bit like looking at a Mickey Mouse image or something. Big ears or direction, or dimensional Mickey. Four I also think about these paintings that you were. I mean, I can. I, I always relate them also, I guess, because of the materials they're made of, the curved metal, the paint, is, and I think about them in relation to you restoring cars. Also, that the culture of Los Angeles, and you are interested in kind of dealing with that and car paint. Does that have any? No, I reject that none? completely. Okay, good. 
Got it uh, on the record. That was, that was, that was a New York uh, slam against all California artists as being uh, sort of, you know, uh, Hollywood, uh, uh, winking, blinking, all that sort of thing. Um, I think the process that I, was, that I just tried to describe is, a, 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 for good or bad, it's, it's, it's a really hard look at the history of modern art. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, a ra it's a radical history. I mean, if you think about it, you start out with something beautifully painted uh, pictorially. I mean, think of, a, think of a brilliant painting uh, in a classical sense. Why would anybody take something like that apart and, you know, essentially destroy it? to the point where, it's like I use the, the, the idea of Malevich, you look at suddenly just a white square on a white ground, and, and even his friends asked him, you know, my God, what, what have you done? Uh, you've taken everything we know, love, understand, and cherish, and you've eliminated it all. You've left us with a pure desert. And he made, a, I think, a very important uh, distinction when he said, yes, but it's a desert of pure feelings. And he introduced back into the realm or back into this thing, the idea that feelings actually count, that intellect, in a sense, does not completely override it. And uh, too many people have participated in that history over too many generations with too many different backgrounds for, for it to be either accidental or incidental. And I think as an artist at this point in time, we have to at least uh, consider what that history is about. And uh, I, should, I should note that um, when you talk like this in a way, it maybe begins to stand, sound intellectual or verbal and that. And I have to understand, I grew up in L.A. making hot rods and uh, swing dancing and uh, wouldn't make a pimple on an intellectual's ass, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, that's important that this is not a, a verbiage. It's, it's a, a kind of hands-on, was a hands-on perceptual process. I don't know if that confuses or... To, uh, to take us to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and a very famous moment in the history of the museum, certainly, and in the history of art in Los Angeles and in thinking about art in art history, um, I thought I'd embarrass you with this photograph. <laughs> that's Bob right there. <laughs> and that's James Terrell, I think, right behind him. Uh, and this is, I guess you're in, the, you're in the anechoic chamber, right? That was constructed as part of... Um, project that you probably all know, uh, Art and Technology, and that was uh, a curator here, Maurice Tuckman, who undertook this project. It resulted in an exhibition and in a catalog, which is are quite famous. But um, perhaps people, not everybody knows that a lot of what was done in the project was not even shown, that a lot of what was done was encouraging experimentation. The idea was to bring art and technology together, which um, I think you were skeptical of from day one, right? Yeah. And had other reasons for being willing to participate. Art, art and technology uh, uh, was a red herring. The whole thing was a red herring. And you said what, so. What was really, uh, I think, what, yeah, I did. What was really crucial there is if you follow what I was just saying, I realized by the time I'd painted a painting, it wasn't a painting. Uh, and it was the only thing I knew how to do. I, didn't, I had no idea what that meant or wh where you go from there. It was like people, my friends, would say, well, you've come to point zero, and in a sense, as far as I could tell at the moment, I had come to point zero, and I had no idea where I would go. Uh, it's like the whole bottom of my world fell out, because everything I had done up to that moment was a part of another kind of thinking. And uh, uh, I thought, well, you know, it, it, the world's not out of balance. If, um, if I'm thinking it, it's because it's thinkable, and therefore someone else is already thinking it. And I assumed that probably what was going on in physics at that time, maybe in biology, uh, was certainly uh, parallel. And if it wasn't, I better go back to the drawing board because, as they say, the world's not out of balance. So I thought it was really, at that moment, it was not about art and technology. It was about art and artists sitting down with uh, people in other disciplines and discussing these kind of fundamental issues. I, I think physics is a classic example. Uh, it became almost philosophy at one point. I mean, the, the, the change, the character, the quality of the change uh, was so great, uh, an entirely different way of proceeding in the world. And they, we, we had uh, found out we had essentially parallel issues. I met a man named Ed Wirtz, uh, Dr. Wirtz. Uh, moment of sentiment. <laughs> right. he, he died just recently. Uh, the interesting thing for me is that we did not produce uh, a product for the, for the exhibition, but um, 
he radically changed my life. And uh, I think I radically changed his life, and, uh, which is a different kind of meaning yeah. uh, and not attached to a thing. Right. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, it was in that exhibition that the, the stand-in, I guess, in the show was the column, um, which we still have and just took out of storage, dusted off, and is being uh, restored right now to be shown in an exhibition upcoming. Um, but the real story, I guess, was the process behind it, right? Yeah. And the working. I, I always read with fascination. I know it was also a time you met um, Richard Feynman and spent a little time with him. Yeah, that was, that was, that was an amusing uh, meeting. Richard Feynman uh, was quite a, a, quite a character. And uh, he had decided or was willing to take me around to meet all the different... Uh, uh, I, I went to JPL and met the people doing the Grand Tour of the universe and went to J, uh, uh, IBM and met all the people and talking about artificial intelligence and uh, artificial reality or virtual reality. Uh, but he arrived at the airplane. His wife brought him to the plane, handed him his lunch. He got on the plane. Nick. We sat down next to each other. He took out his drawing pad and started sketching people on the plane. And I, of course, was there to pick his brain about uh, essentially that which was all beyond uh, uh, the idea of drawing or the idea of, uh, of, of a pictorial uh, approach to things. So we, we had a really great time. I had a great dialogue together. I uh, had a lot of fun. Uh, uh, and it was, uh, he's the one who introduced me to Ed Wirtz, uh, who, I, I go back for just a minute, was one of the most interesting people I ever met because I had met all these other people in, in the scientific world, in the philo philosophy world, and they were all quite brilliant, but they were also very, I guess because of their practice, very channeled. Uh, for example, to do the, the, the Grand Tour, where they were, gonna, uh, they were really focused on what they were doing. Ed had a, a very different way of approaching, a really interesting mind, and in that he, uh, there was no information that he didn't consider to have some validity, even to the most mystical, or a laying on of hands, or uh, witch doctors, or wh whatever it might be. Uh, and he felt that there was always a basis of some, some fact behind it. And so he would take information from here and from here and put them together in the most alarmingly interesting and revealing sort of ways, as opposed to being someone who is brought up within a discipline, functions within a discipline. He was in an interdis interdisciplinary. And uh, uh, he, it was like, gave me a whole different way way of thinking about information and how one gathers it and how one evaluates it, et cetera. And taking it away from being task-oriented, but developing more like philosophy, a kind of pure inquiry about certain fundamental things that underwrite all ideas, all information. And it's why I had to educate myself, self-educate myself in philosophy, because I, I, at one point, it seemed every argument whirled around maybe 10 key arguments in philosophy. And uh, if you didn't know those arguments, uh, you were at loss. You were always dealing with secondhand information or information which had already been processed. And I don't think artists uh, can afford that. It's the same thing about the history I was talking about. You can't afford to accept history as it's written or uh, history as it's been given to you or as it's taught to you. It's too important, it's too fundamental that you need to do it yourself. You need to decide how you feel about it and what your uh, um, uh, understanding of it. You're in a new generation and a new point of view, a new moment in time, and it needs to be reviewed periodically. Um, yeah, I, I well, know. and to, you know, to take that, I know when you started <clears throat> reading philosophy and studying philosophy on your own, which is after, I guess, you were studying the philosophy of Coke, he also told me how to judge a good Coca-Cola. <laughs> That's, um, that might be a level of sophistication. <laughs> Our machines aren't so good, by the way. We're working on it. <laughs> Got a consultant. Um, I love the fact that to go back to the Malevich note about the, the desert of pure feeling, that you took yourself to Las Vegas, right? And in a, had in a, a room overlooking the desert, and that's where you spent time in the library reading philosophy. Well, that was, yeah, I, was, I did do that. I did that because I got run out of town, but that's another whole, that's a long story, and I figured nobody would look for me in Las Vegas. <laughs> the last place an artist would go, of course. So. The, uh, to stay on 1969 for a minute and Ed Wirtz, 
Um, one of the most interesting projects that I, I always thought you were involved in, and, and I go back to again and again in thinking about even what we're doing today in the museum, is that uh, he was asked, I guess, in 69, in the summer of 69, to consider this problem of formulating a new approach to certain areas of research having to do with habitability, which was about space habitability, right? The idea that we'd be living in space at some point. It was long-term long space travel. That's right. What's, what it's going to take to send somebody out for 10 years and bring them back sane. I mean, right now they can do it for six months by kind of gritting their teeth and getting the ball scores and their wife saying goodnight to them and stuff. But after 10 years, that may not hold up. <laughs> so the conference was about habitability, which I know there's a long story there, but it, it, it's always struck me. This, it was, um, you ended up designing the space for the conference. Uh, I know Frank Gehry was involved in that, Larry Bell was involved in that, and that the, as it's written in the Art and Technology Catalog, and of course I've heard the story many times, but that as part of that experiment, you created the uh, set for the conversation to take place, this discussion, and the interesting thing, unlike the um, you know, going to a hotel for a conference is that you, you actually changed the environment every day, right? For three days or four days? Three. Three days. Um, and it, I, I think it is worth describing that, if you, if you would for a second, how those environments changed. Because the thing about it is that it, is a, it, it was a conference about that. It so clearly demonstrated that our, that our perception, our mood, everything about us is influenced by our environment. So when we have bad underground offices in the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, it causes a kind of depression and, you know, it's hard to work there. But that's the simplest formulation. The largest formulation is how it can inspire as well and force change in the way we think. And um, I know that you started, in, I guess in the three days, you steadily deconstructed the environment, true? Yeah, with, uh, the first, uh, it, it was a, a conference, it was the first international symposium on, uh, excuse me, on long-term, uh, I'm having a little sore throat here, on a long-term uh, space travel. And um, NASA put it on, and of course they were able to attract an incredible uh, a, a caliber of, of participants from all over the world. Uh, they were people in 15 different disciplines. Uh, many of them had worked for NASA before. They all flew into Los Angeles. Normally what you would do is you'd fly in and you'd go to the Hilton Hotel and you go downstairs to the conference room, which are generally very hostile spaces. Uh, and uh, so what I did is I had them, um, I, I, had gotten, I got a hold of a building in Venice and uh, 72 Market Street, and um, uh, they, people were bussed down there on a circuitous route so that there was a disorientation. And they arrived, uh, they arrived in an alley and uh, the, the back of the building, there was a brick back, and it had a blind entrance in it, um, in which the bricks were just knocked out, and they worked their way into this uh, space. And when they got inside, the first day, it was a completely in a capsule, uh, like being in a space capsule in a way. It also had only indirect lighting, and it had uh, a very reverberant sound, um, uh, so that, uh, in many ways, very uncomfortable so that they could carry on a verbal dialogue in a kind of normal tone. I built an island, and the island was built out of, I built logs of um, uh, cardboard that was laminated together, which eventually is the furniture that uh, Frank Gehry took credit for. Uh, <laughs> we built these logs, and, uh, and everyone sat kind of in a, like a, a, you know, on this island in a way. And uh, it, they persevered because it was not, they were not comfortable, uh, but they were there, they had spent their money, I mean, not their money, they'd been brought here to do a job, and they had a, a, a four discussants, and then uh, people, respondents in a way, and they persevered. Um, uh, it almost, uh, maybe almost pushed it too far, and they almost fell apart, which uh, was all right in a way, because that's the kind of hostile environment they were trying to um, uh, 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 deal with. Um, at the end of that, I had built, the front of the building was built out of sauna tubes, uh, which Frank Gehry did the uh, 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 Hollywood Bowl with right afterwards. Uh, and 
were able to just swing the, uh, the sauna tubes up and they were able to walk out. Suddenly they were out on the street. And I had, uh, there were a number of artists besides Larry Bell, uh, uh, a lot of artists that lived in, in the Venice area. And we prepared a meal for them, a very carefully prepared meal in which there were bite consistency changes, hot, cold, color. We thought about all the aesthetic elements of it. Basically, all the physicists got in one corner, the educators in another, the psychologists in another, and ate the food and talked. Um, then in the afternoon, we prepared 15 rooms, because there were 150 people, 15 disciplines. 15 rooms, one room a little too large, one room a little too small, one too reverberant, one too sound dampened, one too bright, one too dark, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. One where the walls were slightly tilted and so on and so forth. <laughs> And, but, but subtle enough, and it was very interesting afterwards to look at the arrangement of the chairs, how everyone tried to adapt to this space this, uh, and the discomfort of the space. Um, and they, again, they persevered. So by the second day, they uh, arrived, and uh, the front of the building was now a kind of uh, a screen of, uh, of uh, translucent material. There had been two skylights which had been blocked out the time before. The skylights were gone and there were just these squares of light and the light floating in. The back also had a screen on it. And so you were kind of like being in a mosque in this very kind of light and airy space. And the uh, interesting thing was that uh, the, the uh, dynamics of the, of, the, of the room changed quite radically. People started taking their jackets off. In the middle of the first discussant in the morning, a psychologist admitted that they were on a wrong track, that they were doing something that they weren't beginning at the beginning, that a psychologist in this particular thing trying to evaluate and equate the uh, psychological issues and process and problems with each astronaut was in fact being forced to deal with his information in a manner to compete with, say, someone who was supplying the water, uh, in which they could do it to the ounce, to the inch, to the cent. They could feed mass of the kind of information they wanted. But he said, our information doesn't come out in the ounce and the inch, to the, and the, uh, et cetera. And that we had taken on this way of dealing with our information and completely corrupting it. And so I found that a very significant moment, which had been something that in the philosophy that I was very struck by is that we, we seldom ever think something through from the beginning. We start in the middle somewhere, and we gain all kinds of information through all the different processes of education, et cetera. And we start in the middle. Uh, again, I go back to, for you people as artists. Uh, you, you can't afford that. Uh, you're already buying into too many things that may or may not have validity. Um, they obviously have because we start out from a historical ground, but we're going somewhere, and the historical ground has to be understood and interpreted. Um, so. They, at the end of that, we cut the, the screen and they walked out. And uh, there was now conversation and what have you. Each was, they were switched to the other room. This is a long, hopefully not too long a story, but they were switched to a different set of rooms. And three or four of the groups decided that they, they were not going to stay in there. It was, and they went out and sat on the beach and held the conference on the beach. And, uh, and, and, on the, uh, and they, they participated more and more in the food in that. On the third day they arrived, there was no front and no back on the building. It was simply in the street. The police stopped and wanted to know what was going on. The garbage guys came by and asked questions. It was, uh, they were suddenly in an entirely different environment, and they had, had made a shift in which they were now questioning the process itself, which I thought was very interesting and quite significant. And um, at the end of that day, uh, uh, again, the, the, the rooms. Uh, and almost no one went into those rooms on the last day. They were just too uncomfortable, too hostile. Uh, the significance of the story for me is that on the fourth day, one person from each discipline was intended to stay there uh, to have a discussion about what had taken place and what they thought about it. Uh, about 110 people stuck around, if I, our count was right. 110 people stuck around because they felt that something significant was going on and they wanted to play with it some more. Um, and then Ed, uh, as the scientist, uh, uh, about uh, a month later, uh, polled everybody and wanted to know, uh, asked them a certain series of questions about what had taken place. And it was interesting that only 10% of these people, although they had had this experience, connected the idea of their environment with, in a sense, the conditions of their environment, and that's what they were there to do. 
Right. And uh, <clears throat> I think that that is something that was part of your research, which informed so much of the work you did later in also then constructing environments. And I guess I connect that story to the work, to the experience of working, for example, on the Beacon Museum, where everything gained in importance from the sequence of arrival, what you saw first, uh, how order was set uh, in symmetry or against symmetry, and how a sequence uh, of experience in time and in a place would unfold. Um, and I've always thought that connected very much, even to the, that story is relevant even in what we were talking about today, uh, when we were having a meeting in the museum about how we might improve some of the exterior features of the museum, um, add landscape, add plant material, and I'll show you some drawings later, but um, I was also struck by how you, how viscerally uh, you feel these things in the sense that you told me a story that when we had our first meeting here, I guess three or four months ago, that was the first time you'd been back to the L.A. County Museum in a long time. Well, I, I, uh, I, 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 to put the story in context, I came to the museum after, and it's not, it's, it, they've, they've changed a little, they've modified it slightly, but when I first came after the, the what's the name of the guy who built the building in front, after they built that building, uh, that plaza inside there, I found to be one of the most hostile spaces I've ever been in my life. And the, the idea that a museum would be that, uh, that hostile, have that little sense or concern for aesthetics, seemed to me to be all wrong, and I didn't come back for 20 years. <laughs> but, um, uh, this is just the cover of the collection of the, of the Ponza Collection catalog. Um, and again, I remember seeing this work, which is literally a, an opening in a room. Um, created in a certain way so that the sides are angled and framing the outside. Uh, you talked about losing the frame, and then you actually did a whole set of work that was based on framing or unframing. Yeah, they're, 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 the use of the frame, I use the frame as a kind of almost like an educational thing in a sense. We are highly addicted to the idea of framing. We're highly addicted to the whole idea of, of this system of signs. It's a, by the way, this is not an antithesis. Uh, th this is one of the ways we, we function and we, we know. So the idea of modern art presenting us with another kind of reality is not just that. It's, uh, therefore, you can't have a hierarchy. In other words, it's not one idea replacing another. The, the pictorial reality works. It's just not the sum total of, 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 of reality, per se. Uh, and um, the... the uh, 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 one of the ways that we know something, for example, when you get down at the bottom of abstract expressionism and people say, well, what is it? Which is a literate question that says, well, take this, this which is in front of me and let me understand it, not by participating necessarily directly, but referencing it something in the world and how well it represents that other thing in the world has to do with the veracity of the thing. Um, and uh, so you, uh, you have this uh, whole way of sort of going in the world and... Um, uh, and we're addicted to it, so that when, you, when abstract expressionism essentially eliminated meaning altogether, uh, it was therefore unapproachable from that point of view. In other words, it was the wrong question. What is it would get you nowhere but the wrong place, essentially. You had to shift the entire context to such. That was what it was implied. Uh, but how does something, an idea like that, get into the discussion in a deeper sense in the culture? Normally what happens is that we take this new idea, which is obscure to us, and we put it into an old context. We put it into a, one we're familiar with. For example, the painting. So you put it back in the frame, and you have a Campbell soup can. Now, a lot of people thought that the Campbell soup can was a reaction against abstract expressionism, but it was not. It was a secondary act activity, which was the process of culturating, of taking it in, as further into the dialogue of, of what we mean by and how the culture understands the idea. So you have the Campbell soup can, and suddenly you're confronted with something which is totally meaningless and done in a way which is not intended to be authentic per se, and you have to wrestle with it because it's in a context you understand. And the best story for me, I love this story, is there was a guy uh, who was, um, it was an article in news either Time Magazine, I think it was, in Time Magazine, and he had, uh, he was a painter, and he painted kind of quasi-religious 
German Expressionist paintings. And as far as he was concerned, of course, he was an artist. And he also, during the day, designed the Brillo box. And so when he was presented with a stack of Brillo boxes, you can imagine his confusion. How, how can this possibly be art? I, I'm an artist, and this is, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So he was forced to deal with this whole idea of, of meaninglessness and, and, and what, what was at stake when that what takes place. So um, uh, using the frame was a way, in this particular case, real quickly, Hansa had this strange collection, and it was as housed in a very strange way. They were all these separate rooms, and you would go to the first room, and he, would have, he had a friendly guy that worked with him, and they would come, and they'd open up the first room. He had these big locks, clank, 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 and he'd open it up. That there'd be Angelino. a room full of, what? Angelina. Angelina, yeah. You'd, there'd be a room of, of, uh, of uh, uh, Sarah's or something, and then he'd go to the, ne you'd stand there for a few minutes and look at him. They were badly lit, and you'd sort of stand there and look. And then you'd go out, and you'd go to the next room, clank, 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 and he'd open it up, and there'd be, uh, you know, someone else there, uh, Don Judd, and then he'd go to the next one, clank, 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 and they opened it up and bang. And by the time he went through about 10 of those or 15 of those, it was like being in a bank vault uh, <laughs> and, and airless, you know. So I went through this whole thing with him, and at the end of that, I decided to just put a window with air, you know, just, just let the light in. I mean, there's windows, and there's windows, and they're everywhere, but there are also windows. In this particular context, having gone through that, that window, I think, had some significance. He, of course, decided that once he owned this thing, that as long as he maintained all the dimensions exactly, he could put it anywhere. Uh, uh, and in other words, decontextualize it in a way. So I, it's there now, because we did arrange for it to just stay there as it was. Well, good. <laughs> right, does he still have all the locks? No, no. It's uh, more open than see, that. well, it's lost its significance. This is a. <laughs> Speaking of framing and a piece that sometimes is, is available to the public here in Southern California, one of my favorite works, um, I think that you've done this work that was done in uh, 90, well, this is a photograph from 97 in the Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego. It's actually in La Jolla here. And thinking of that whole idea that um, when I first saw that museum, how could you have a museum and then have windows onto the ocean like that and expect anybody to look at art? Um, that it seemed an impossible notion to compete with this incredibly beautiful and powerful natural environment. And of course, as he always does, he went into this, this situation in the gallery, I guess you were invited to make a piece, and uh, you came up with this work, which I don't know if we, I don't know how the pointer works on this, but um, let's see if that works. Uh, so you have these three big windows, and if you can see, there's actually a corner. And what you see that appear to be light spots and all appear to be three squares, one in the center, sort of framing with the horizon line through it. And these two are actually in the corner, but perceptually read as squares. So you have three perfect squares from this point. They're actually uh, in a corner. You can see there's a little edge of butt glazed glass here. Um, and what they are is actually just removal of the window. So they're just three cutouts. Um, and so at once, you solved the complete, the entire problem at once. Uh, you, you made the inside and outside permeable. Um, of course, you didn't have to compete with the view. You made it part of the work, and you changed forever, I think, the way people uh, walk into that museum and how they might look at that uh, landscape. One of the nice things about that particular thing is that you don't know that until you walk up and finally stick your hand out. Right. You know? And it's true. And literally. Although, even the, although you were hearing the sound and you're hearing, feeling the air and that, but you're not sure. Uh, for years, I had off and on been gone back and forth in San Diego, and I'd hear people constantly going through, especially people who didn't like so called modern art, they would walk in and say, Well, now this is a relief. Uh, or this is, well, this is beautiful. I mean, this is art. And so it's, it's, uh, I, it's the same thing I was saying about I gave them a frame, suddenly they got to wrestle with this idea of perception is not, right. you know, boxed. And uh, I mean, that whole idea of also giving the museum a, a breath of fresh air, I think that's part of your work and part of the reason, hopefully, you're here. Um, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 uh, j j not, without it being a love fest, I have to tell you, I'm here for one reason more than any other, it's because of Michael. Uh, working with Michael at, uh, at the DIA. 
uh, he, he was a breath of fresh air. It's the first time I've ever worked with someone where I didn't couch my information or I didn't, let's say, not give them all the information uh, so they didn't rush to judgment that I didn't, in a way, had to deal with it. Uh, just the opposite with Michael. I respect his opinion so much that I showed him everything. And he fed me back stuff that was real information, things that, in a sense, changed, altered the project. So in a funny way, it was what people talk about as a collaboration. That, uh, I guess, respect for your work and interest in, in your thinking was also reinforced uh, because I had an opportunity for a year to um, study to be an artist for a while uh, at the University of California, San Diego, very close to here. And this is a work that you can actually go visit. Um, and the beautiful thing about this work is that it is in a grove of eucalyptus trees and it is in this path where students on the campus travel. And in fact, if you go up that hill, I don't know if we're looking up or down, you would go to the art building. So for a year off and on, I would take this path uh, to my studio in the art building. And you walk through this beautiful uh, grove of eucalyptus trees. And kind of in your peripheral vision and up in the air, um, you would see these stainless steel pole, I guess they're stainless steel or aluminum poles. No, stainless. Stainless steel poles um, that mimicked the trees in the grove. And then up above is this field of blue, which is actually made um, from chain link fence, right? The plastic coated chain link fence. So it was a field of color, this field of color in space, which we'll come back to because we'll see another field of color in red. Um, and it was an amazing work for me because it was, it was in your peripheral vision. It was something you could look at. You passed through it. You didn't actually go to see it. It was sort of just on your path. So it became entirely part of my life as it's become part of the lives of many uh, students on the campus. It's part of the Stewart collection that uh, Mary Beebe there has curated. Uh, there are many other works on the campus. But this was one that I had a chance to live with. And I guess it is always... Um, it's always, it was always in mind and still in mind for that reason. And I love the fact that you actually didn't have to go to the museum to go see this. I like the fact that you didn't have to go on some religious trek into a, you know, way off and play that it just, you encountered it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think I am going to skip over New York, the Whitney, because it's going to be a long discussion, right? Uh, well, I, I can make it short. We can... I can make it short. There's oh, on my part. All right, I'll sleep. Yeah, okay. Too Let's short, do that. Too short. Yeah, uh, um, We're in 1977 at the Whitney Museum in New York yeah. City. Basically, uh, uh, I, I was given this space on the fourth floor, uh, and it had a couple of really nice qualities about it. One, it, as an empty space, it was a really, it was what it would be in New York, a huge space. In, in Wyoming, it would not be a huge space at all. Um, and uh, the fact that this black slate floor was really uh, uh, just this floating plane out there. Uh, so for a long while, I thought about what to do with it and not wanting to put anything on that floor. That was, that's where it started. So I made this, uh, um, there's one window on the end, which was the architect's revenge. Uh, it's a perfect pictorial window. You look at the building across the street, the angles of the, of, the, of the window are such that it's in perfect perspective. Um, and uh, uh, I put a scrim all the way down the middle and floated it with this steel bar, which is the black line there, and then put a black line on the wall all the way around. The ceiling is, I don't know if you can see it in this photo, but it's yeah. one of those sort of uh, modular grid ceiling, open grid ceilings in a sense. So it had only the three parts of it. Um, and I... Um, uh, and the, uh, the event was fairly simple. Uh, the light went down the room and uh, disintegrated along the walls as it went. Uh, it, it, by the time it reached the end, the end wall, of course, now facing the, the uh, window, was much brighter. So I finally I painted it a gray so that it was the same color that the side walls had become. So there was a visual problem in the, in the, in the room. You, we don't realize that when we walk into a room, at any room, we very quickly make an assessment of the room, uh, observe the dangers, the obstacles, what have you, but we do it in a sense subliminally. We do it so rapidly that we're not cognitive that we do it as such, but we do it at any time. If that wall started to move, these people would all probably start leaping, even though they're not paying any attention to it. So this issue of this thing, if I turned the light on during the, the day, uh, during the night, that wall was 65% gray. 
and, uh, but something was simply not right. So you were frozen for a moment and had to become a kind of first-time perceiver. You had to stop for a minute and reassess the room and deal with that. Uh, the other half of the story, which is, I think, fairly interesting, is that um, I did this piece there, and the Whitney people came to me and said, well, we, we open, we've been open traditionally, we open on Tuesday night. Is that all right with you? And I said, well, it's a bit of a problem since the only light in the room comes from the window. They said, oh, yeah, it, you're right, it just comes from the window. But this tradition of ours is long-standing. Anyway, they opened it at night, and it was a d totally dark room, people walking around, <laughs> walking around with, with cocktail glasses, bumping into each other, and it gives you some idea about how serious you can take museums. <laughs> Which is, I guess... Partly why you started working outside of museums. Well, the, the part of, part, let me uh, to make it brief, as I said, um, that um, uh, pictorial paintings are meaning structures. Uh, for, you start out, say, with uh, uh, the king of kings on, a, on, on the cross, uh, in his, in his, in, in his, bathed in his blood. And then you come to uh, a, a king on a red throne, and then you break it down, and it is a burgomaster in a red vest, and then you break it down further, and it's a, um, uh, a commoner in a red shirt, and you break it down further, and you have a, a, an apple on a red cloth, and you take it down further, and you have just a red square. Uh, and if I were to hold that square for you for, for even just 30 seconds, and take it away, you would have what? You would have a bright green square, just as strong as the red had been a red square. And what you're looking at is the actual mechanism of your own perceptual process, that it actually is modifying the red to protect the eye and projects green on it, so that one of the things that a painter learned, for example, is that you can't paint a red painting without a green, green, an element of green in it, strategically placed to pick up the eye again, to bring it back in a sense, to focus it again as such. But this history of taking it all the way down, in a sense, was a destructuring of that whole process of meaning. And that's a long other story. But uh, what I did, what I did, tried to do in the Whitney is that there were two things that I, I decided that perception was at the crux of the matter. And um, if you look at this history, we've arrived at the point where um, Essentially, everything that we know about painting has been destructured, okay? But two things remain in that first photograph. One is context. It's in a museum. Once you walk in the door of the museum, you are dealing with art. So everything in there, in a sense, is already defined in some way or another as art. So you enter into that situation, and certain structure exists for you, okay? But if you take that away, what are you left with? You're left with essentially just the elements of making in a way, in this case, a black plane, a black line, and a grid. Um, if you take that away, go to the next slide. So we take the black plane on the floor, and I did a, this is on the corner, I think of 42nd Street and Fifth Avenue. In the middle of the night, I painted the corner black. It already was black, but it had grayed from cars going back and forth. So I just painted the frame in there, and I gave you a black frame. So like, like crumbs in the woods, you could go out and find this thing. So it is still, it is no longer contextual. In other words, can we really recognize it art outside the frame? And if so, on what grounds do we do, 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 we do that? It's, there are a couple of issues that come up in this history that have to be resolved. One, if you break the frame, something really critical is lost. That is, think about this, the idea of the frame in a, in a historical sense, a pictorial sense. I make a mark, and every, that mark can be, by anybody who's conversant with it, can be weighed with and against the whole history of marks, which allows an extremely sophist sophisticated dialogue. When you break that frame, you lose that agreement. And so if you're going to play the game outside the frame, or if modern art is to go the next step, one of the issues that has to be resolved is what would be the extended frame of reference. The second thing is if you break the, take the hierarchy of meaning all the way down to zero, what you, in a sense, is no longer have a hierarchy. We know how hierarchy works. You have the top, uh, uh, the, the universe is orderly, God is in the heaven, what have you, and everything else sort of descends from there. We make that art, in a sense, and 
I, the story I always say is that I'm an artist, I've been around a long time, so I'm very close to the deity, therefore I, could, I can teach all these students who come in with their miserable little offerings, I can look at them <laughs> and I can value them and I can teach them the light of art as I know that. Okay, so we know how hierarchies work. So what would a non-hierarchical structure look like and how would it work? That's an issue that has to be resolved. These are the two key issues for contemporary art at this moment in time, and we'll get into that maybe a little bit later if we have enough time. This is, uh, this is just pointing out in the city. You see, down, right down the center, can you point at it? Those are, those are see the, the black frame? Those are just shadows. Uh, when you look uh, down Park Avenue, the sh at, at, at noon you have the light coming from the street, the shadow of the building, the shadow of the building. The so basically it's a found, the same element but no longer, and so the question was, if reception is the issue, can we hold the dialogue, just the dialogue, to be the equal of making? Or is making, in a sense, a, uh, a miss, again, a, a red herring? Uh, and the answer is yes, it is a red herring. Making is one of the ways we go about processing art, but I, it, there's a distinction. We are taught to know about art by looking at a series of brilliant objects and brilliant performances. Um, but each of those performances is, in a sense, a representation of, of, of an artist's distillation of, of, the, of a, a visit with a subject of art. You have to distinguish between the two, between subject and object. Uh, there is a subject, and uh, uh, maybe I'm going on too long here, but uh, uh, I, I went one time when I was a young artist here in L.A., went to a, a lecture at the Pasadena Art Museum. And it was Ad Reinhardt who had come to town. And Rad Reinhardt said very simply, art is art, as art, and everything else is everything else. And then he proceeded to take the via negativa, and he explained all the things that art wasn't. And as he went along doing that, he insulted everybody in the audience, <laughs> who began to get up and leave, and get up and leave, and get up and leave, and finally arrived at a distillation of, in fact, what he thought art was not by talking about it, not trying to explain it. Uh, growing up here, that was very crucial because nobody here wanted to talk about things. Uh, and certain people would, would get really mad at you if you tried to talk about art at all. But it seemed to me there were some things that needed to be d discussed at some point. Okay. And still do. And still do, right. Um, I know that that work took you, as you went, the, the, the thinking back about that quote from Mondrian and talking about an art that exists not as painting as architecture, but actually in environments and maybe in, in dispersed parts, it, it led you also a way to be outside, uh, to share in the park. I see people having picnics, having a great time in, the, in a public sense. Um, I've been several times and watched it grow. I know that as a garden, it's something that is always changing and always developing. In fact, it's probably high point will be years from now uh, when this, um, these trees that are part of the central uh, curve will actually become a, a kind of canopy altogether and become very sculptural. But so many things go on in this project, not just what it looks like, but how it functions. Um, and uh, here we have, uh, let's see, maybe we can show, there, that's the photograph for it, right? Mm -hmm. Where you have this um, walk down and you go through this zigzag path, which is, I guess, the exact angle that works for handicapped access, right? So the zigzag became a functional aspect of how to move from one part of the hill to another. And that is a theme that comes up in your work again and again, and we've always gone through that the decisions sort of make themselves out of some condition in the world. You, the don't, slope. you don't design them. They, they design themselves. They, they essentially reveal themselves. They do, as this did. And then I, the, the trees, of course, will grow together so that they're a canopy of, um, a, for a kind of dappled light or a filtered light and even a, almost a shadow and darkness. And as you go through the zigzags, you go from light to dark to light to dark to light to dark. And of course, at each time you cross the stream which comes down, and I noticed this the first time I was there, it was so impressive how also, everything, the sound changed because, and I found out later in talking to you that you had in fact tuned the sound uh, of each of the crossings with rocks so that you heard a different tune as you crossed. Um, and so sound became part of it, light became part of it, and as you said, the whole thing became a device 
for, for us to take our perception from the scale of buildings, of space outside, to the scale uh, of, of um, sensing maybe a, a, a plant, a leaf, and something incredibly tiny. tiny. So it's a, it's a kind of device uh, that works in many ways, and it functions entirely in a language of art, even though, of course, it's made of plant material and concrete and many other things. Um, I know we included this photograph. I include this one because it amuses me. <laughs> uh, this is two months before the opening. Uh, and and when, when, horticulturalists, <laughs> when horticulturalists come to me and say, I don't know why they got you. I mean, they should have got me. Uh, I'm, this is what I do. You've never done a garden before. And they were right. I hadn't. I had to do a tremendous amount of homework. But I love showing them that photograph. <laughs> it's da it was daunting. <laughs> it's certainly more than a garden uh, in its construction. Um, this is just some of the... This is at the bottom of the path, just before you come on to the... Uh, by the way, the path was handicapped. The plaza, which we'll see in a minute, was, is actually a refuge. The fire department required that there be a refuge, a place to go if there were a fire in the building. So these were other elements driving it, rather than as problems beginning to try and deal with them as opportunities. But go ahead. And this is I felt the by the time you'd come all the way down there, if you were willing to go that far, there needed to be a treat at the bottom of it. And that was, that was it there. Uh, an azalea, uh, what do you want to maze. call it, a maze, right. The beauty of it as a maze, well, again, the kind of interesting opportunity that um, originally when uh, 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 this lower area, the bowl, the path was, the road was supposed to come and swing in and go on around the fire road. And I s explained to them that the garden was too small for what they, what they wanted it to accomplish in a way. And so I began to capture this extra space. I reversed the road and made it go that way and captured this lower bowl area as such. Uh, but for a very long time, they weren't willing to really completely buy into it. They didn't want to um, uh, use guards. They didn't want to have the, the responsibility, the economics of it. So they were, their idea was you couldn't go down there. So of course, since you couldn't go down there, the paths of the, paths of the uh, maze could be water, um, and uh, they were circular. It turns out someone sent me a book afterwards about uh, mazes. There's no such, there's never been in the history of mazes one that did that. So in a way, it acts and looks like a creative thing in which it was not a creative process as we normally think about it. It was conditional. These are, <clears throat> this is the plant material as you surround, you get down near yeah. the maze and you surround the maze as you walk through at the bottom. One thing about the garden, since I was not a gardener, I was very sensitive to the idea that it couldn't be a pseudo garden. What's that whistling? Is that me? <laughs> uh, it couldn't be a pseudo garden. It had to be a real garden. One of the things about, that I liked about it is there's nothing more phenomenological than a garden. It is never the same. It's always changing constantly in motion, uh, and it requires an indifferent kind of sensibility. It requires a different kind of commitment and a different time, of ti time frame. There is a real issue as to how something like that lives on in the world, or does it? If I cast the whole thing in bronze, we would think that maybe we could do it. The problem with the phenomenological thing is that it's ever-changing and never the same. So I want to, um, I'd like to end and just talk a little bit about the project we did together um, well, first, your project at DIA, <clears throat> which was a series of, we commissioned um, Bob to come to DIA Center for the Arts in Chelsea and to use one of the warehouse floors in which he created, um, he worked with Lynn Cook and created this series of rooms made in scrim and light. Uh, and without going into details, because you can't actually tell what this felt no, like from can't. the photographs at all, and I know you were very of mixed opinion whether there should even ever be photographs of this, but I'll just say about its experience from the visitor perspective, you went into this, this, you entered from the side and you went into a series of rooms which were disorienting in the sense that you couldn't tell whether you were looking at reflections in infinity or other space, uh, all the doors were, oops, here we go, all the uh, doors were on the corners, and you were in this kind of infinite space, and I think as you described it, um, it became a kind of non-hierarchical space. 
and you were forced to reframe your per perception, to, to find your way, to find your place in space. And I, I know that as you left, you had kind of made the space yourself in your mind. And it was a completely different experience coming out as going in, and you really had been changed, which takes us right back, to, I think, to the anechoic chamber, where you sit in that dark and silent space and come out seeing the world in a different way. That led, um, led can us I, at the... Can I say something yeah, about you that? Can. Since I brought it up before, very briefly again, as brief as I can be. Um, <laughs> What I like about this is the, the, the discovery I had, and that is um, it was not, it turned out to be very non, I had been talking about this non-hierarchical thing for a long time, but I had never intellectually tried to resolve that question. When I did this place, uh, I just did it, um, it turned out that you could have entered at any point, there was no beginning, middle, or end, there was no directional, no control on where you should go. One of the reasons for the four corners, if you were, say, in a room in the center, there's four choices here, four choices here, four choices here, four choices here. 16 choices at every point. There were 16 ways you could go. There was no reason to go one way or another other than just your instinctual or your pleasure or whatever you wanted. You made choices. Each room had a different set of colors, a different set of, of uh, visual elements in it. And, uh, and afterwards, when you walked down the street, you couldn't essentially hold it in that sense of, of like that. You could feel it, but you couldn't hold it you couldn't away. couldn't remember it. You couldn't actually remember couldn't. It. And right. it, was, it was, in fact, many of the same principles, the choices that you make as a viewer in any space that became operative in the, the design of the Beacon Museum. This idea, if you'll see, remember these, where you have four corners, four spaces, four doors you can go in, uh, was reduced to two, and often multiples of two choices. But many things in this project I found to sort of find their way when we worked together um, to restore and convert a factory, a Nabisco box printing factory built in 1929 on the Hudson River, which looked like this when I found it. Uh, in fact, it's a true story that it was, I found it from the air, from an airplane flying down, flying my little plane down the Hudson River. And um, uh, it was, we were looking for space for Dia's collection. And we were looking in Massachusetts, we were looking in New York. Um, and I was actually, we were flying to Massachusetts with uh, Lynn Cook and Richard Gluckman, curator and architect, to look at Mass Mocha at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, we both, we looked down and saw this factory near the river, and we noticed it had sawtooth, a sawtooth roof, which meant it had skylights, and we all joked that should be the place where we should put the museum. We flew on, and about three, four months later, when all the other alternatives um, were, didn't work out, um, I remembered this place on the river, and I remembered it had a faded Nabisco sign on it. I had no idea really where it was, because when you're in the air, you have no sense of boundaries or, 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 or cities. And um, we did a lot of research. It took about three weeks to research what it might be. It turned out that um, we got the number for Nabisco. They said they didn't have a factory on the Hudson River, certainly one that didn't have their name on it. Long story short, it had been bought and then bought again. It was empty, and it was available, and I could go see it. So I drove up on a very cold March day, unlike the sunny day you would have in March in Los Angeles. And uh, it was a dark, cold day, as would be the case in New York this time of year. And I walked into this, uh, uh, this little building right here, which was a dark building, and walked into uh, what was this huge, vast factory, which was lit by natural light. Um, and it wasn't one second before I realized that would be an ideal situation for Diaz collection. Um, and then I walked back out to look at the, you know, derelict conditions and uh, showed it to artists. Lynn Cook and I discussed it being a possibly perfect site for the uh, collection. But the question was, then what do you do with it? How do you transform it? What do you do to make it a very special place for this collection? And I guess taking a cue from Dia's history, where artists um, it was not just about artists showing their work, it was about artists also determining how the work would be shown, because the artists in the collection had a tremendous sense of uh, space or environment, which extended perhaps in its most extreme to projects that were in space and environment, like Walter de Maria's land, um, land art projects, like the lightning field, um, but also in the fact that there was a tradition that artists would 
would display their own work and would even uh, create the circumstances for it, namely artists like Donald Judd also or Dan Flavin. And so we thought the best thing to do would be to seek an artist's advice and an artist's involvement. Um, because Bob had done the project at DIA and we knew he was, uh, I guess, the master of the three-dimensional environment and of thinking of light and space and this building was about light, uh, we would ask his advice. We ended up commissioning him to do um, a plan for us with no no permission from anybody else, from trustees or anybody else. The idea was to see what could be done. And you came and worked on a plan, uh, which led to a series of drawings and proposals for the museum, which largely turned out to be the way it was built. Um, this was the factory looking from above, and you can see the kind of derelict parking lot. The Hudson River is just right over here, and it is directly on a train uh, stop. Um, this was your first drawing done, actually a rare drawing done on the computer, and I was showing it not for the, necessarily the beauty of the drawing, although it's quite nice, but... Computers the, can't draw trees. <laughs> <laughs> which you see clearly here. But the fact that the finished they, product... They never tell you that. <laughs> the finished product looks almost exactly like those first drawings. And it was an amazing take on this transformation project. Um, this is a photograph which I took much later, again from the uh, airplane showing you this site on the Hudson River, which was particularly appropriate since in some ways the Hudson River was uh, one of the birthplaces of American art, if you think about 18th and 19th century art, and to put this new museum here seemed to be an ideal thing to do. Um, here's the museum. And what was interesting, and I think the brief we talked about, is that I hated museums that had thresholds, that had a, like a big set of columns and banners and you cross that big threshold and then you knew you were in the museum and that was the deal and then there would be an information and ticket desk and you had to buy a ticket. It both interrupted your experience and somehow it created a big barrier to the experience of art for me and it was then became about the museum rather than the thing inside. So part of the brief was to have no threshold. Uh, another part of the brief was to take advantage of the rural setting and to create something um, for the outside as well. But because we had seen the Getty Garden, it was exactly not the idea of the Getty Garden where you take a demarcated space and then you just put something there. We had engaged uh, Bob to do the whole plan, to think about it as a totality and as an experience. And uh, I've told this, see, this is a drawing that was made for the front parking lot. And as many people have said to me, if you need to design a parking lot, um, you go to get a California artist, because they know how to do parking lots. <laughs> we have one of the most beautiful parking lots in the world here among this uh, canopy of trees, which I'll show you in a second. But to say something about the process, you ended up living in New York to work on this. So I think, as you said, you could really run your hands over the building and feel it in space and in fact. And the amazing thing, as opposed to an experience you would have with an architect, and I've certainly had many of them, uh, not to make a value judgment, but there's a very different process we went through. And you would take uh, me and Lynn to the, to the empty factory at that point, which was really there. And because it was really there, and it was a rehabilitation rather than a new project, you didn't have to look at plans and drawings and imagine. You could actually have some feelings about it. Um, and then you would ask us questions like, uh, is the building better in its symmetry? or against its symmetry? Or is it better to look north or, or to look south first? Or can you tell me the difference, he would say, can you tell me the difference between the color of light on the east and the west? And I think it was of it very much being a Socratic dialogue uh, where you were sort of uh, having a dialogue with us, testing us, thinking about it, and coming to some ideas about what the space could be. We concluded by, in fact, the end result of the process was to take the back of the building and to make it the front, uh, to take the ugliest space, the parking lot, to create a parking lot that was a special experience. And it really is a seamless experience because you go from uh, the train that you might take up or the car, you walk from the river, you go into the parking lot, you're met by a plaza, you actually come from, com from a, a hard top to a plaza which is surprisingly green as opposed to finding the hard top in the plaza. And then you can actually go right into the museum and you'll just see in this photograph, you can tell that's the entrance. It's the antithesis of the giant lobby. Um, that the entrance is the tiniest space and it opens you to this vastness of the museum. Uh, this is, uh, let's see if we can take, uh, this is the drawing. Uh, 
Um, you also use elements indoors and out. Uh, that was one of the key elements of the project, I think, the permeability of inside and outside. You need to go forward. Yeah, there you go, I guess. This is the uh, drawing that was to show you the sense of symmetry and ceremony because we talked about the fact that the hardest thing in this project was that the building was so beautiful on its own, the mission had to be to not screw it up. Uh, that was the deal. And then the other aspect of it was, yet it was a museum and it was a very special experience. So we had to allow the visitor to feel the specialness, the ceremony in a secular way, if you will, of the, of the path to the museum. And you did that by, uh, by, in fact, using symmetry, which became a key element to the design. And that was the, this is the way it looks from that drawing. Again, those first drawings, which were done, I think, within the first week that you took mm -hmm. on the project, ended up looking very close to the final result. Um, this is one heck of a parking lot. And it puts you in a work of art. Before you even know that, here's the Green Plaza. Feel free to interrupt if you want to make mm -hmm. any statements about this. You're doing very this. well. Here's the, uh, <laughs> here's the Green Plaza, which surprises you, which you actually drive over as part of the parking lot, so you can get very close to the museum. And, uh, You'll see here one of the most interesting elements was how we organized inside and outside. The trees became uh, echoes of the columns that were inside. And there was always this back and forth between inside and outside through the whole building from the moment you got in. And you really were in an artwork. And here's where I'll come back to the color in the UCSD piece. Um, the, I'll tell the story of your starting with the cherry trees, flowering cherry tree trees to give a sense of specialness to that entry, and you ended up changing, it was hard to get cherry trees, but you found another tree, and this other tree uh, was a uh, winter king hawthorn, right? And this tree, which you see here in the winter, um, has, it has white blossoms in the spring and these incredible red berries uh, in the winter, which you can't see very well in that photograph, I don't know if you can. But when you, you're at the deadest time of year, the worst time, and this time, a little bit before this time of year, in the dead of winter, you come into this parking lot, and it is a field of red. And you are literally inside a sculptural environment of color, uh, unlike uh, any I have been in, not unlike those fields of blue that you did with the fencing material. Um, and I guess you turned then a negative or an absence of what you wanted to do into a total positive. And uh, the story is... <laughs> I'll say one other story. I'll, let, I'll tell one story for him. And this is the artist, the naive artist, uh, who comes in. And when you, I guess the reason people didn't use Winter King Hawthorns was because they have very prickly... Um, Not prickly, they have thorns. Thorns. Yeah. They're about like this swords. big, and they'll just absolutely hurt yeah, you. Yeah. So they, we figured it could be a little dangerous to have that as you're getting out of your car. And I think as the story goes, you ask the simple question of whether you could take the thorns off. And uh, I guess the, at the nursery, they said, well, yes, you can take the thorns off. And then I think you asked, well, if you take the thorns off, will they grow back? And the nursery's answer was, no, they won't grow back. Why didn't we think of that? <laughs> <laughs> and so here was this undiscovered resource <laughs> of these amazing trees that only the artists walking in from the other side of the... Uh, they were the only trees not sold because they were not saleable. <laughs> It turned out to be a bargain, and then we got it done on budget because of that, with incredible beauty. Um, and of course, the, the fantastic reversals, the, what was the entrance, what became the entrance was actually the bathrooms that were added onto the building later, and it was sort of a fantastic reversal to take those and make those the, uh, as you did, the, uh, here's the design for the entrance, which became this entrance. Specifically small, dim, um, and what it did is as you walked through this darker space, it allowed your eyes to, to open up slightly, and then you walked into the vastness of a football field size of space and light, which are the galleries inside, which again, pictures would do no justice to. Just to say, the theme of, 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 of the building for me was also uh, to do it entirely with natural light, and this is something that not only thinking about your work, but artists like Don Judd, who didn't like to use electric light because it seemed uh, that natural light provided a better environment for the works. So this sawtooth allowed for natural light. And in fact, we closed the museum at dusk, so it has earlier hours in the winter. And again, it emphasized this relationship to the outside because it became a bit like a park. They also don't open on Tuesday nights. <laughs>
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> Sunday brunch is the usual opening Sunday time brunch. in a natural light museum. Oh, I should say something about the choices and the uh, experience of the DIA project in New York as it he, you used symmetry to the extreme because there was a wall that divided the, the building in half. There were actually two buildings put together and you decided to make that wall the central feature of the entrance so that there was a post right in the middle and you had a ch choice of two doors. And this, the experience of the museum is of the visitor continuing to make choices. Um, and without going to the details of the experience of light uh, and space and direction, uh, which you'll have to go there to see. You also use the outside, again, for functional reasons, using the same thing. You weren't going to make plant material for the sake of it. It was always going to be for a reason. Uh, there was a space, there was, it, there was a difficulty of negotiating between three levels in the building, one that was here, which was a garage, one that was here, which was a main gallery, and a basement space, and you devised a garden, in this case, as a way to um, mediate between the spaces. So here's one level, here's a second level and there's a level behind and the garden became not just a break in the experience of the museum but it was literally an outside staircase de device to connect the three levels together and it was the only way to do it so it became functional as well as beautiful um, and uh, I'll tell one small story about this tree very quickly this is a weeping hemlock which we were at the end of the project and Bob found this weeping hemlock in a nursery in New Jersey, said it was the most beautiful tree, one of the most beautiful trees he'd ever seen. It would be a great object of contemplation for the garden. Um, and uh, this was right at the end of the project. There wasn't a nickel to spend and I was feeling the squeeze and I said, Bob, I'm not sure we can afford another nickel. Uh, he called me back a week later or a few days later and said, well, he would pay for them because they were so beautiful. And I said, well, that's impossible. You can't pay for them. We'll pay for it. We'll figure it out later. Um, so these beautiful trees went in. A year later, a, a, a naturalist came and recognized these weeping hemlocks that you had found in New Jersey and said, oh, that was so appropriate that, the, that Robert Irwin put these weeping hemlocks here, which were found and discovered and named on Mount Beacon, which is the mountain that <laughs> is just above the museum. And I said, oh, you must be thinking of something else. These came from New Jersey. And she said, no, in fact, this is a something Sargenti, and it was, in fact, named and, and found on Mount Beacon, and it turns out that John Singer Sargent's brother lived in Cold Spring and uh, dealt with this plant material, had a nursery, discovered this plant, and named it. And so it had this incredible, eerie quality of connecting the art history to the occasion, to your gesture, and so those are there for you to see. Um, and my personal favorite part of the museum, and this was a great moment, I think, in the conversation. The museum, we were, we were actually putting the building on the National Historic Register, taking some pride for the workers in the community that worked in this building, because this building was the life force of the community. Uh, we wanted to restore it, and there aren't many buildings on the Historic Register, National Historic Register, which are factories, which are workplaces. So there was a sense of pride in restoring this uh, to, to that. We had a lot of requirements. We couldn't change things, therefore. Uh, there were limits on what we could do, but there was a feeling that if we could achieve that, we would have achieved something very important. Um, so we couldn't change the windows, which were quite nice, and they were uh, steel windows with the regular factory glass that's slightly obscure. And, of course, there was no air conditioning in those days um, and no, not much electricity, hence the natural light in those days. Uh, and these four quadrants were made to open so you could get fresh air, thinking back to your Ponza piece or to the uh, San Diego piece, so you could bring fresh air into the factory. So you took one look at those and sent us a drawing, uh, which resulted in the windows uh, that actually ended up looking like, and here it is. Did I push the button? <laughs> Where's, uh, uh, all right, there it is. Um, these amazing windows where you made the simple decision to, uh, yeah, it looks like it's actually that good and worth applause, uh, to take obscure factory glass and simply put clear glass in the four quadrants, which were then sealed shut since we now had air conditioning. And in one fell swoop, uh, you had entirely solved the problem of the view out the window being so strong that you would lose reference for the art. Uh, then again, as you had proved, if you don't give somebody some fresh air and space and, and a sense of looking outside, then you were keeping them uh, closed in. And by giving these little flickering glimpses where you get a picture of the uh, sky or the trees, it's like a filmic experience where you see inside and outside. And it was the ideal permeable membrane between inside and outside that became the metaphor for the totality of the architecture of the project. I remember when we did the first mock-up, 
We weren't absolutely sure. We were pretty sure it would work. Uh, we saw it for the first moment and knew it was for sure a home run. Uh, and it was a, it's, a, it's one of the rarest and most beautiful parts of the project. And again, um, as I say, not something I think thinking differently than an architect would think about simply restoring it or changing it. Um, this was a way of thinking that was about adjustment, uh, the assisted ready-made, if you will. And this is how the building looked when we found it, with vast open spaces made for factory workers. The great thing is also the floors are incredibly comfortable. They were made of maple over two inches of pine, so that the factory workers would have an easy time during the day, and they wouldn't get tired walking around, which is, of course, the perfect floor for a museum. The light was all north-facing skylights, so it created perfectly even light, like an artist's studio, of course, perfect for a museum. And from then on, I always thought, you know, the factory design could always inform museums uh, forevermore. Uh, this is the course of its transformation. Uh, these are big files. You'll see, we did get rid of the green, by the way, which was a little weird. Okay. Is that thing's big, not working? Uh, I think they're big files and they take a while to. Is that right? Did I click it? There you go. There's part of the transformation as it's happening. And this is what it looked like finished looking at a John Chamberlain sculpture on these maple floors that you couldn't afford today with this ideal natural light. Um, you asked me to read this, which I will, uh, about uh, that some, a text that Peter Sheldahl wrote when he was reviewing an Agnes Martin exhibition that happened much later that Lynn Cook had installed in the museum. It's not a, not a review, but just a reaction. Right, and he wrote in uh, what... I guess he thought about in seeing this Agnes Martin exhibition, he talks about Barnett Newman and Agnes Martin. Uh, he talks about that sense or state, which he calls either spiritual in quotes or maybe nameless. And he writes, uh, what is the value for life of spirituality as a secular discipline? And I know that's why you were so interested in it, that question of spirituality as a secular discipline. Martin's art sustains that question, an American preoccupation since the New England Transcendentalists, which became newly acute in art with Rothko, Newman, and Reinhardt. When unrelated to a particular belief, might transcendence be no more than a neurological burp, soothing the mind as the alimentary kind does the stomach? I thought about this at the lovely, light-drenched Dia Beacon, a magnificent place that devotes a terrific amount of real estate and remarkable architectural skill, meaning his, to implementing little hits of pure aesthetic emotion. Uh, an anti-church, it offers, in place of religion, beneficent addiction. The hit wears off quickly, you want more. This may be the upward limit of what liberal culture can provide for the common soul. Uh, perhaps it's enough. Certainly, Dia Beacon stirs grateful awe. Look at what we humans can do. And I attributed that when I read it to um, the work that you had done in transforming the space into something completely unique and different as a totality of an experience, which is why we've signed you up for the job of helping us here. <laughs> so... I don't want to say so much except to say that we're having a discussion here about the nature of the environment uh, and the landscape and the experience of the museum and what can be done to enhance and reorganize it. Um, and I'll tell, I'll tell this story and maybe you can add something to it. So I asked Bob if he would critique some of the plans and take a look at what can be done to enhance the situation. And he, um, he said, well, I'll take a look at it with you and see what I think. Maybe I have an idea, maybe I don't. I think you came to the meeting, you took a look at it, and uh, you then pulled out of your back pocket an envelope with a series of pictures you had taken over 25 years or something like that, or over years, and they were all of um, palms, palm plants, palm trees. And we had been having this discussion about how you make the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, something you see from afar and you want to go to when you come to Los Angeles, and how it would represent us as a place and attract uh, and, and sort of attract that interest. Uh, and I think in one fell swoop, you said, well, you've got to know your audience. They come to LA, they want a palm tree. <laughs> they want sunshine, they want light, and they want a palm tree. So uh, while you had never worked with palm trees, you'd never really done a project with palm trees, it was something that you thought would be an ideal thing to do here. And so we've embarked, I guess, on another journey about how palm trees uh, might uh, be part of this building, this oasis 
here in Los Angeles, if you will. And uh, we thought it was particularly appropriate because I think in the next two weeks after we had that discussion and began work on thinking about a palm garden or some way to create a, a strong presence for palms of all kinds in an architectural structure, that Mayor Villaraigosa announced he was removing palms from Los Angeles, <laughs> which only added a kind of perfect symmetry to that. <laughs> and of course, one, we could probably get palms on the cheap from anybody who wanted to get rid of them. And number two, if they were being dismantled or removed from parts of Los Angeles because oak trees were considered more environmentally friendly, then they could be nothing else left for them to do but to be cultural objects, and therefore we should frame them in the museum. <laughs> so I guess what we have in store for you in the future as part of our discussion is, is that we uh, maybe we're working together on the possibility of creating an environment here that would not be entirely, but would include uh, a, a commitment to these beautiful forms and shapes of uh, palms. They're magical. Yeah. And so, like, the, like the man who, who is finding the palms, who I found in this process, who I love. He's one, of the, one of the great things about palms is they're like cockroaches. <laughs> They'll be here a lot longer than we will be. <laughs> So that's something to look forward to. I know it's been a long, <laughs> long evening. I thank you all for sticking with us. I, um, and I really appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you.